Hey guys, just what the world of YouTube needs, yet another battery pack build. Today, it's the Lido Kala. They're marked 7,000 milliamp hours. That's a lie. The spec sheet says 6,500, and we'll see what we actually get out of them. Going to be a 4S pack, means uh, four batteries in series, one in parallel. I'm not sure if you only have one, if it's really parallel. Anyway, it results in a 12.8 volt pack. I'm welding my pack together with 8 mil wide by 0.15 mil thick nickel strip. You could easily buy the batteries with tabs already welded on them and make this a soldering project. There is no need for you to own a spot welder to do this. This orange stuff is called Captain Tape, K-A-P-T-O-N, not like Captain Crunch. And its main claim to fame is its temperature stability. Well, hopefully we don't need that, but it also is a plastic tape, and so it's a pretty good electrical insulator. Another good insulator is silicone. It's temperature stable across a pretty wide range, so it will stay flexible even if you're out in the cold, and it will stay an insulator even if your battery gets warm. This stuff is cheap, readily available, and really easy to work with. The heart of any lithium battery project is the Battery Management System, or BMS board. This is a board specifically designed for lithium iron phosphate cells, so it balance charges the cells to the proper 3.2 volts that's right for that chemistry. This particular board is also rated for 30 amps, which is the correct continuous discharge current for these cells. When the pack is done, we'll shrink wrap it up. This stuff comes in all kinds of neat colors, but this black happens to be particularly heavy duty, which I really like for field use. And finally, a supply I don't see talked about a lot, that's fish paper. This stuff is designed specifically to be an electrical insulator. And what we're going to use it for is to wrap the two batteries that form the center of the pack. I'm just going to glue it right onto the outside of the battery using some hot glue. You have to remember that we're building a series pack here. So we have positive of cell A connected to negative of cell B and on down the chain. Well, that means that the two outside surfaces of any adjacent batteries are not connected to each other like they would be in parallel cells. They're at uh, opposite polarities, if you will. And if you get a wear spot in the case of the battery and two batteries that are next to each other come in contact with each other, you just created a short circuit. So the fish paper makes just a real good extra little safety factor, if you will, Wrapped around the two center batteries of the pack, it makes sure that you've got something besides just whatever cheap plastic your cells came in uh, between you and a short circuit in your pack. Ultimately, my pack is going to have three things holding it together. There'll be the hot glue in between the cells. There'll be the captain tape that I'm going to wrap the whole thing in. And then there'll finally be the shrink wrap. I don't really want to dwell on the welding process here. As I mentioned before, you can buy the batteries with the strips already on them and turn this into a soldering project. I will say that if you're going to go the welding route, do it with a proper welder. I know there are lots and lots of DIY spot welders out there on YouTube, and who doesn't like to build stuff? But running high current through a lithium battery is not something to be taken lightly. So either get yourself a proper welder or let somebody else do it for you. With the batteries assembled, I turned my attention to the BMS. The first connections are the wires that go to the external connection. Now, I'm using what's known as a common port BMS. It has one port that is both the goes in and the goes out. I'm soldering these connections on both the front and back side of the PCB with flux and solder to make sure that I'm using all of the available trace material to handle the full current. The rest of the connections on the BMS end up going to the battery cells. I'm going to start by tinning all of the pads on the BMS with solder before I introduce the wires. The connections to the plus and minus on the battery cells have to handle the full current of the load, so they get the same 14 gauge silicone wire as the external connections do. The other three connections are just for monitoring individual cell voltages and balanced charging, so they can be much, much lighter weight wire, although I'm sticking with the silicone insulation. The BMS attaches to the side of the battery pack with the captain tape. Couple of things to look out for here. One, you want that BMS sitting on the fish paper, not on the cells that are not extra insulated. And speaking of extra insulated, try not to run the captain tape over top of the MOSFETs. It's an insulator and the MOSFETs are trying to dissipate heat. That's a bad combination. The main thing you're looking for though is the orientation of the BMS itself. If you put it on in the right direction and on the right side of the battery pack, 
you won't have to crisscross any of your wires to get to where they need to go. I attached the sense and balance wires first. In a perfect world, I suppose you would cut these and solder them onto the nickel strip before you attach the nickel to the battery. But if you're starting with pre-tabbed batteries, that's not really an option. And besides, this is the only way to get them cut to the perfect length. As soon as you get one end of the battery pack done, cover it completely with the captain tape. You never know when there's going to be a stray piece of metal or something on the bench. I mean, do your best to keep it clean, but you do have wire strippers and scissors and other conductive things laying around here. Getting all of the exposed points covered ASAP goes a long way to preventing accidental shorts on the construction bench. Starting with the negative end of the pack, I tacked one more nickel strip onto the battery to serve as a solder point for the negative power wire. I'm putting a good bit of solder on the wire first and then crimping it up inside the nickel strip. I'll go back and reheat it after it's crimped, shove a little more solder in there for good measure. This keeps the heat time actually attached to the battery down to a minimum. On the positive end of the battery pack, I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to make sure I've got a piece of fish paper shoved underneath this time because that positive lead is draping over the negative side of the battery. That's a short circuit if the plastic on the battery case fails. The last of the connections to the pack have been made at this point, so it's time to go ballistic with the captain tape. First, I'm going to tape up the end that I just finished. Then I'm going to flip the pack on its side, cover up those plus and minus connections that I just added, as well as tape down the rest of the BMS itself. Where the leads that go to the external connector exit the pack, I'm going to put one more layer of fish paper down. These connections are going to get wiggled around as I connect and disconnect the pack, and I don't want to take any chances that I end up with a short circuit here. So lots and lots of layers of insulation and lots and lots and lots of glue to try and keep this stuff as steady as possible. And a final layer of Captain Tape around the business end of the battery makes sure that that positive terminal is well insulated and adds one more layer of physical strength to the external connection. For my external connection, I'm going to use Anderson Power Poles. They're pretty much a de facto standard in the ham radio community, and they happen to come in a flavor rated for 30 amps, which is a perfect fit for my battery pack. Do bear in mind, though, that you've got a live battery pack at this point, so don't go stripping both of your power connections at the same time. Put on one of your power poles and then tape it up real good and solid before you go stripping the other one. Only after you've got that second connection stripped, crimped and inserted into the power pole plastic housing is it going to be safe to untape the first one and expose it to the world i find that a pair of needle nose pliers makes inserting these things into the power pole shell a whole lot easier especially when you're talking about the second one because you've got sort of limited flexibility with this short piece of wire here i always put the little rubber booties on my power poles keeps stray stuff from getting in the back of them and the finishing touches on the pack are all heat shrink. Little bit on the wire that's exposed to the external world, and then the big stuff for the pack itself. For the most part, battery shrink behaves like any other heat shrink tubing. It's going to shrink a whole lot in diameter, and not so much in length. In fact, I probably cut this a little bit too long. We'll see here in a minute. Do watch your temperatures when you're shrinking this, though. And yeah, it is as much fun as it looks. But take your time. Getting the battery pack warm for a long time is probably okay. Getting your battery too hot can be catastrophic and, best case scenario, ruin all of your hard work. I did end up cutting this just a little bit too long. Not a real big deal to trim it and then uh, warm it up and kind of roll it around on the table. You can get nice corners out of it, but it is probably better to cut it the right length to begin with. In my case, it doesn't matter a whole lot because I tend to like to run electrical tape around the packed longitudinally anyway. This covers up the ends where the heat shrink tubing is open and gives you, yet again, one more layer of insulation against the ends of the cells where all of the electrical connections are. One finished pack. Let's charge it up and see what she's capable of. So I ran this battery through the same test procedure that I used on the 25 amp hour battery I bought from AliExpress a year, year and a half ago. I'll link that up here in the corners if you want to see the test bench in that procedure. Characteristic 4S LIFO discharge profile. It stays well over 12 volts, usually over 12 and a half for the bulk of its discharge cycle, which is why we love these things for ham radio. I keep telling you guys the size and weight are just a bonus. The voltage is the reason these batteries are cool. 
The next row displayed in the table is the last sample where we were still at 90% or better of our 13.8 volt uh, operating nominal voltage for the radio. You can see that it took just over an hour to get to this point and the battery had delivered just over 50 watt hours. That's pretty consistent with the rule of thumb for operating a 100 watt radio. You're gonna pull about 50 watt hours operating for an hour in a field day, soda pota, that kind of an environment. And just one other thing to note over here in the last column, after that one hour and 53 watt hours of power delivered, the battery is close to 70% discharged. Another 23 minutes later and we've dropped just under 11 and three quarter volts or down to 85% of the 13.8 volt target. This is really the lower limit specified in the manual for your average radio. You, they don't want to run at any lower voltage than this which is fine because if you look over here in the depth of discharge column, this battery is basically dead at this point. It's almost 95% discharged at this point. And if you remember the slope of the voltage curve at the end of the cycle, it's dropping like a rock. There's not really any more power to be had at this point. For the sake of completeness, I let the test run another six minutes or so until the BMS cut off discharge from the pack due to low voltage on at least one of the cells. Now, one thing to note, I probably would have expected the BMS to cut off the test here on this line or maybe the next row. When we get down to 10 volts, somebody's got to be at two and a half, right? Well, it turns out they're discharging very, very evenly, and those fractions of a volt do matter. So it took another 40 seconds or so for the BMS to detect that at least one of them was under two and a half. That's fine. This is really a uh, cutoff of last resort. I don't anticipate operating the battery down to these levels anytime soon. So in terms of capacity, the bottom row on the chart here says six and a quarter amp hours. That is well within the tolerances of the stated six and a half amp hours, given that we're pulling more current than the 0.2 C that's uh, required to get the stated capacity. In the real world, I'm only going to operate this pack down to 90% of my desired voltage and 70% depth of discharge. That way, everybody stays happy and lives long and prospers. Uh, that means I'm getting just a little bit over four amp hours of capacity in the battery or just a little over one hour of runtime with my output power set to 100 watts. Now, an hour of runtime isn't a whole lot, but that's at a full 100 watt output. If I turn my output power down to 50 watts, I only lose half an S unit on the receiving end. And now I've got two hours of runtime out of that battery. I build a second pack and run 50 watts. Now I have four hours of runtime plus the ability to be charging one pack while I'm running off of the other one. Of course, the other interesting specification is the greenbacks. What does it cost to do something like this? And I think that comes out pretty favorably. I've tried to account for absolutely everything that I used, of course, with the exception of tools, right? In my case, there's a spot welder, but you don't need that. Soldering iron, solder, crimper for the power poles. There, there are some tools involved in building a thing like this. Heat gun for the heat shrink. But putting the tool costs aside, the materials to build just one battery pack, to build exactly this battery pack, work out to be about 33 bucks uh, if you get the stuff from AliExpress and, uh, you know, shop around. Different vendors have different deals on the shipping. And the interesting thing is it's $33 to build the first one. Many of these things like the heat shrink, the tape, the fish paper, the bag of power poles, they, they come in quantities such that you could make 10 or a dozen of these batteries. And if you start ordering the cells in bigger quantities and you start ordering the BMS in bigger quantities, they get cheaper, quite a bit cheaper and fast. So it might make a good club project or something like that. Oh, and I guess I should point out that most of these components are in fact available from domestic suppliers. If you don't want to wait 60 or 90 days to get cheap shipping from AliExpress, all of these things can be bought from U.S. suppliers. It's just going to cost you more. And just as a basis for comparison, right? we're not going to name names here because it's not my goal to take any shots at anybody. Uh, but if you go shop around and find a very, very popular comparable battery, like stated capacity of six amp hours, so it should perform similarly to the battery that we built, um, you're going to be looking in the $80 plus or minus range, depending on who you get it from and, uh, and where you get it. But the other thing you're going to find 
is that packs in this capacity range typically don't have the maximum current specs that we would really be looking for. Uh, for instance, the Brand X pack that I looked up has a maximum current delivery of 12 amps. Well, that's not enough to run a 100 watt radio at 100 watts. Now, given the capacity we've got and the limited runtime that will create, I'm not sure that's something you wanna do regularly anyway, but my pack gives me the option. If I wanna turn the power knob up to 11, I can do it and it's not gonna last long, but it's not gonna hurt my battery. And just the other little, maybe this is a personal preference thing, but I really don't like the dual port BMSs. It really, really just annoys me <laughs> to have to have one connector with one kind of plug on it to charge a battery and another connector with another kind of plug on it to discharge the battery. Seems dumb. I didn't build mine that way. So is this the universe's ultimate Uber battery pack? No, it's just a battery. It's a 4S LifePo. It performs, discharges, charges, blah, 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 like all the rest of them out there. But that's kind of the point. There's not much secret sauce to one of these things. If you source your components carefully, you can save some money. If you take your time building it, you can do it safely. And when you're done, you can have a battery that performs well and have had a good time in the process. So questions or comments, leave them down below. Hit the sub button, the bell. I don't know, whatever YouTube's gonna give you this week, just mash some stuff while you're down there. So whether you're building or buying, get yourself a battery for that ham radio. Taking it out in the field and operating portable is just a heck of a lot of fun.